evening, everyone. It's actually delightful to see so many of you here. Um, welcome to you all. And a particular warm welcome to President Barroso and to Jal de Omega, and I'll talk about him in a moment. Now, it's traditional on these sorts of events to give a very lengthy and warm introduction to our speakers, but I'm not going to do it because you know who they are, which is why you're here in the first place, and you know they're immensely distinguished. Now, for President Barroso, obviously, um, he started his political life, most importantly, as a professor of law, or as an assistant <laughs> professor of law, which is um, where most good people start. Um, he accidentally became pr um, Prime Minister of Portugal, and then when he got fed up doing that, after quite a short period of time, uh, went off to become President of the European Commission, did two terms, uh, was the uh, second um, after Jacques Delors, who had done two terms, and might ask you about uh, one of your successes is obviously hoping for a second term in a moment. So the important man and now Goldman Sachs and when he's not doing that he's doing the uh, global lives on vaccines which is really important too in the light of what we've seen over the last few years. So his right is what I hope I can call my friend and colleague Jao de Almeida. Now Jao um, has done many um, important jobs but his most important job has been as a visiting fellow at Trinity for his last terms, and this term he's slumming it at Peterhouse. Uh, but when he's not been doing that, that is perfect. <laughs> when he's not been doing that, he has um, been uh, an EU ambassador to the UN and to the US. He tells me, I'm allowed to tell, say this, that uh, he's seen Nikki Haley putting her bins out because they shared uh, the same building uh, for a period of time. And then when he moved from there to become the first EU ambassador to the UK, of course, he wasn't an amb ambassador at the beginning because Boris Johnson, in his wisdom, thought that um, he wasn't important enough to be an ambassador, but fortunately, sense prevailed. And so um, he has lived through uh, Brexit. And the way we're going to do things this evening is that um, I'll ask a couple of questions to uh, President Brexit and Jan will ask informed questions to Professor uh, Barroso, and then we will we'll take some questions from the floor. And we'll be finished in about an hour's time, so um, you've got um, time to get to get some dinner. So I'm going to sit down rather than sort of uh, bellow from here, but I want to start with actually a rather big and indeed um, rather scary question. In fact, because I, I spent the weekend in Warsaw, and... Um, what struck me more, I've been going to Warsaw for a very long time, what struck me this year more than anything else is the fear. The real fear about um, what's happening in the world. And I would like to just give you a very general question to start to ask you. Are you frightened? And if so, can anything be done? Uh, thank you, first of all. Thank you very much for your extremely kind words, Professor Martin. It's a great pleasure to be here at Trinity College that Faculty of Law at uh, of Cambridge University. I visited the last time for the Alkin lecture when I was president's commission, but as people say, criminal power returns to the place of the crime. <laughs> to that. Uh, anxious and uh, nervous I am, and I, I'm concerned with the current situation. Probably because of the <clears throat> main practice, I will not say I'm frightened. <laughs> uh, we try to avoid words right. But in fact, this world today, <clears throat> if you take some kind of perspective, is certainly more polarized, more uh, <clears throat> fragmented, more unpredictable, and more dangerous. The doubts about it when you compare with situations before. And uh, and there are some reasons for that. In fact, some trends we have seen already for some time, including the pandemic, and even before the pandemic, before the pandemic, we've increased rivalry between the United States and China. But the pandemic has accelerated some developments in terms of supply chains, the more fragmented, the beginning of some decoupling that is happening, in fact. Some people call it the risking, but in fact, it's decoupling. There is a reason for that being decoupling. It's because of science and technology at the heart of it, because science and technology are, most of those technologies are dual-use technologies. They are also technologies for war. And that's what we are seeing now. It's preparing for war. 
technology being part of that preparation for war. If you look at statistically, empirically, it's the biggest ever expenditure of good weapons. They're the most sophisticated weapons. So, uh, assuming that uh, economically not all actors are practical, they are investing for some reason in weapons, including, by the way, development of more sophisticated weapons, including, by the way, the concerns with the nuclear. And we have uh, some trends, these that I believe are new compared with what we had in the so called Cold War, was the moment after the Cold War. <coughs> it is the fact that we are seeing at the same time this polarization between countries, conflicts, but within countries. Our societies, never the Ukrainian societies, were not in my lifetime, I cannot remember as polarized as they are today. From the United States to uh, what happened recently uh, in Europe, I mean, many countries in Europe, from, from Spain to the Netherlands, Turkey, uh, Brazil, Austria. So democracies that are, as they never were, so polarized. And so uh, what is instinct? I'm frightened if you want to use that uh, active or that word, uh, is that <clears throat> one thing reinforces the other. For instance, the refugees and illegal migration has been one of life motives for the lives of the far right, as we have one of the countries that has the biggest tradition of liberalism, liberalism in the classic sense, more liberal country in the world, like the Netherlands, where a far right xenophobic part wins the election. As it was that. So this is a complete new development. And uh, and we can quote many other cases. So this is reinforced. There is another element that I believe it's important for us, namely here in Europe, <coughs> is that a common pattern is what I call the mobilization of resentment. So Namely, after Russia, the invasion of Ukraine, I believe that is the decisive moment. The world is no longer the same and will never be the same after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. This is not simply a European issue, as some friends I have in, in India or in other parts of the world that say, oh, you know, Europeans are always bringing your problems to the rest of the world. Why are you saying that? The fact is that it's a global issue, and we can see why for the impact it has from food security to energy security to issues that are already developing in that region, in Africa. For one mistake that President Obama, very intelligent man, I have quite of meeting him in many meetings about G8 and G20, but he made a very big mistake among others when he said that Russia was a regional power. Russia is not a regional power. Russia is the biggest country in the planet in geographical terms, and it cannot be considered a regional power. Even if it was a regional power, we should not call it a regional power. All forms of arrogance are forms of stupidity. And we should avoid any form of arrogance when we deal with this, these matters. So this is why I believe we are going to see that deepening. So we are seeing a deepening, a widening, and an acceleration. That's something. Time is also important. We, we are in one of those situations in history where we see history seems accelerated. Uh, for us, what happened recently? Who could have thought that uh, Finland and Sweden were going to join NATO? I mean, it would be possible three years ago, into um, February 2022. It would be impossible to admit Finland, or almost impossible, and Sweden in NATO, or Denmark, join the European defense mechanism again. So we are seeing a lot of developments that are showing this trend for more polarization, and that and the trigger was the invasion of Ukraine uh, by by Russia, and I believe this has, is going to be accelerated now very much for conflict in the Middle East, the war Israel Gaza or Israel Hamas or Israel Palestine war. This is another factor of reinforcing the resentment of so-called global south against the so-called global north, means Europe and the United States, basically. And I just came from the African Union summit in Addis and last week. Last week. It was amazing to see some leaders that we considered moderate, including by way President Lula from Brazil, who was guest of honor, someone I know for many years. And in fact, now, those who were speaking behind, before me, besides the host of the conference, uh, were, in fact, Prime Minister of of Palestine and the Secretary General of the Arab League. And you can imagine what was, what was discourse. So this is coming more and more 
as something where the West is in the defensive. The perception in China was like, I met some time ago the Prime Minister of China, Premier, as they said, Li Qiang, and also met several members of the government. And it's quite interesting to speak, and now I'm no longer in politics, so I think now they speak with me with more sincerity. And also, since I left politics, my level of sincerity is increasing day by day. <laughs> I can speak completely. I'm representing no one except me, which is, of course, rather weak but position, but that's what I represent now. I'm not representing any institution. And in fact, in China, their perception is that the West, namely the United States, we are in an irreversible decline. Not only economically, in terms of the share of the GDP and uh, trade globally, but in the general decline from a cultural point of view, from a political and diplomatic point of view. This is a perception in China, at least at elite level, quite clearly, but it's not very different in, in uh, New Delhi or in Ankara or in uh, Pretoria or maybe also in Brazil. That's not to say. And this is something that puts us in a, a difficult situation because the West, Europe, and the United States are accused of double standards. And in fact, we are appear less, let's say, commitment to our own values and to our own principles. And so this is why I think I'm not surprised that you felt that in Poland, Poland being, of course, in the front line with uh, Russia, that is indeed a very dangerous power today. Sorry to a little bit long, but I want just to give uh, where I, I see things in general so that we can now go deeper if you want on some of these points. So following that up, given that you've said that the Russian invasion of Ukraine was the trigger, the question then is, is the EU doing enough? What more should the EU be doing in respect of Ukraine? The EU has been a remarkably united, of course, with the always exception of Mr. Orban, that uh, that it's typical also, and it's not bad to uh, show that, in fact, we are unity, in the, that our motto is unity and diversity, so no one is uh, obliged to follow exactly the same line. That's why we are European Union, we are not the Soviet Union, we are European Union. So there is a, lo a lot of, of diversity in, inside the Union that has 27 countries, but remarkably, the European Union has been basically on the same page, committing, Taken together, if you take everything together, so financially, the humanitarian aid, receiving refugees, and also in European is probably the first donor to Ukraine, head of the United States. That's not what the statistics in the media will appear because they put it by country. And so the United States by country is certainly number one. But find way, Germany is the number two. Germany is number two. People don't have that idea. But certainly, Germany is number two in terms of financial support to Ukraine. Uh, but if you take together the opinion, all aspects is the number one in terms of support to Ukraine. If you take the humanitarian, the humanitarian aid, the financial aid, also the military aid, and all the other forms of aid that the European is committing. But of course it should do more. Um, but in opinion, by definition, I'd say it's slow. It's incremental. It's adapting. It's more reactive than proactive. That's the way the European is. Uh, you mentioned, Professor, that I was leading the European Union <coughs> Commission 10 years, and I could tell many stories about that, how difficult it is from the idea that comes when you take an initiative, the Commission takes an initiative for a regulation, for a directive, or even for a communication, non-binding, non-binding, so-called soft law, and how long it takes, it can take five, six years. So if you compare this pattern that with what the European Union is doing now towards Ukraine, it's remarkable. How, how quickly the European Union is able to take some decisions. Is this, but this, this is not sufficient. Not only Europe, but the others. I mean, the European Union, you okay, have to do more. Uh, inside the European Union, there are quite different, uh, important differences. And also, the United States, there is a big doubt about knowing how long, for how long are the United States going to be committed, because the reality is that we need the United States for that. And uh, one of the interesting developments now is that we are trying, I mean, people in Europe, I say we, but I'm no longer in any position in the European Union, but because I remain a very committed European, that's why I continue to say we, but I think that today, the feeling I have is that in Europe people are trying to think, what if, what if the United, we cannot rely for people longer in the United States? On all efforts, that's a very important deal. 
which actually brings me very neatly to my next question, which is, what if there's a Trump presidency? Exactly. That is the concern that uh, I just came from Brussels this uh, Friday, Thursday, and that was, and I met many people there, and that is a concern. Uh, because let's think about what happened before. For Trump, we already have some track record. He, one of his first most important decisions was to leave the Climate Convention of Paris. Because the United States is the only country in the world out of the climate convention. Iran was member, North Korea's member, <laughs> Cuba, Venezuela. So the so-called rogue states were members of this multilateral system. The United States out. That's where Angela Merkel, a very good friend of mine, someone who usually measures very cautiously every word she says, she said, and that's remarkable for a German chancellor to say it, we cannot rely on others as we used to do. Maybe it is time for us. Europeans to take our future in our own hands. That was when she said it, when Trump took that position. And afterwards, you know, well, Trump had very nice words to put in during his mandate and after the mandate to uh, other dictators, autocratic leaders, but always very harsh remarks about Europeans. Not only about European as an institution, but they about the Chancellor of Germany or the President of France and others. So this, uh, I mean, except Farage, I don't know any European politician that was really praised by President Trump. So this is, of course, a matter of concern. Uh, and, uh, and now, I think if, if he's elected, of course, he'll be much more aggressive and probably some kind of provocation. <laughs> because, as you know, his, his position is that uh, he won the election, but it was stolen from him. So, it's that. So this is a matter of concern, not only in Europe, but in other parts of the world. Of course, you have to think, and I should have said that I'm committed European, but I'm an Atlanticist. I'm one of those persons who believe that we, uh, we, are, we should work with our like-minded countries. The United States are one of the biggest democracies in the world. The United States is not just the present. The United States is a Congress. It's the academia. It's the media. It's the civil society. It's science. It's the Great business and companies are very some of the most innovative companies in the world. In fact, the United States continues to be the number one power from a technological and scientific point of view. So the United States is much more than America, the White House, but of course it's a matter of concern because the President of the United States has a lot of power and can do a lot of good things, but also a lot of bad things. Good, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Catherine, for organizing and hosting and any other colleagues that contributed to this. Thank you for coming. Uh, I have a disclaimer. Uh, we, um, we are friends and I was his chief of staff. So we don't diverge that much. <laughs> so it's not the idea for a clash here at the top table. Uh, and, uh, and it was an honor to, to work uh, with you at four years for five years in yeah. the first mandate as president. I, I have a few concerns as a citizen. I don't represent anybody anymore like you. Uh, so I, I'm free, or freer than I was, let's say, as a diplomat. But, uh, you know, I, I'm very worried by the Trump prospect. I was ambassador to the U.S. I traveled all around the country. And I know what Trump represents. It's more than himself. It's uh, some deep trends in America. And this is not going to go away, even if he is not elected. So I'm worried about the U.S. Uh, uh, as you said, I think uh, we need to work with the U.S. Uh, and the other element where I think we should focus is it is new context, and I wanted to have your views on that. Uh, how much can we uh, try to work better with the United Kingdom? And how much should we encourage our United Kingdom friends to work better with Europe? There is an election in Europe, but most likely there will be an election in the UK in the coming months. So how do you see in this new context where our countries and our values are being challenged, if not threatened, uh, what does this mean for not only the transatlantic cooperation classic between the EU and NATO, uh, but also one that involves most directly the EU and the UK in this new context? Okay, thank you. First of all, was wrong. Thank you very much because, in fact, I should have already said thank you because the idea of myself coming to see you uh, here uh, comes from Joel, such a great friend and indeed someone 
I learned a lot of it because when I joined the European Union, I mean, the president of the commission, he was one of the longest serving Portuguese civil servants in the commission. In fact, he joined the commission before Portugal joined. He was in the initial team, uh, in the transition with the initial team of uh, one of the Portaol of uh, Jacques Delors. And, uh, 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 and afterwards, he made a great career, including, by the way, in my office. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> stop. So really great to be with Joao here today. And, and afterward, he had that experience of being infected, an interesting experience of being ambassador in Washington, ambassador in New York, United Nations, and the first European Union ambassador in, in the UK. About the UK, let me tell you very frankly, I, I'm sorry, because I know it's always difficult to say things about concrete countries, but uh, we are in academia, so I'm free to express my opinion. I was extremely disappointed with Brexit. I'm one of those Europeans who are really anglophile. I love this country, I respect this country, I admire this country. I think this country is of the middle powers, one of the most influential, but let's put it clear, it's not in the first league. That's important, honest about it. Where is power today? And they had the privilege, by the way, Drum was also uh, with me in some of those meetings, to be in the G8, at the time it was G8 with Russia, or to be in the G20 where global decisions are made. It's the table where decisions are made. Who runs? United States, China, and Europe will fit this together. All the other countries, with all respect, from Japan to India today, or UK today, or, are in the higher quotas. And some of them, like UK, that is, this, I mean, it's where we have this language, English, that is today became the lingua franca, and it's also has a great diplomacy from my point of view, and a great know-how, great cosmopolitan view. But it does not have the leverage or the power. That's as simple as that. <laughs> and I mentioned counts. There was a famous uh, European politician who said once, in Europe, all countries are small. The problem is that some have not yet noticed it. <laughs> but that's reality. I mean, Germany. At least the biggest European country in, the, in demographic and economic space, not counting Russia, that's a specific case. In, in Western Europe, Germany is by far the biggest economic power, and the biggest economic, uh, biggest demographic. It's very small compared with the United States or compared with China or compared even with India from a demographic point of view. And so we need the European dimension. And then I can give you my, my testimony. When I was in the European Union, I mean, not only 10 years leading the Commission, but before as Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, foreign minister I was eight years in the Foreign Ministry. So I was in the Council, it's the European Union, as you know, and I hear many of you come from law, you know how the European Union works. It's not just the Commission. Of course, it's Commission is important, but we have the Council and Member States are. So I was, in fact, since the 80s in the Council of the European Union. I hope we are the most important players, those who shape the European Union, you know well as well. It was France, Germany, and UK. Yeah. And UK was not a lot less influence than France and Germany. Contrary to what I've seen, I've listened here. On the contrary, I remember well enough the day of the European Council, when Tony Blair was taking up his initiatives, or even Gordon Brown, and even David Cameron, they were as influential and as sometimes more as the German Chancellor of the Prince of France. The climate change package would not have been possible without British leadership. When we discuss anything from trade or a strategic relationship with the US or China or Russia, the United Kingdom was one of the most decisive, if not more, the most decisive voice around the table. Today, it cannot act. Today, it's the same thing. It's its own. I mean, with great diplomacy, with intelligence, with connections, with special relationship. But do you remember what people said that after Brexit there will be a free trade agreement with the United States? Where it is? <laughs> Where it is that trade agreement? After all these years, I've not seen it. And there was Trump, it was Biden, so different administrations. Because the UK now lacks that level. That's why we need be together. So what I expect, I expect, first of all, particularly young here in academia, but I think I can make that comment. I, I, I'm back to Labour will be next election. So that's why Europeans are preparing for that. 
And of course, what the new government will do is to try to adapt to a new scenario. I don't think it's realistic to wait, at least in the foreseeable future, for the UK to join the European Union. I don't think it's possible. From what I know from the United Kingdom, but I think it's possible to have a new kind of balanced and uh, more, let's say, convergent and uh, more, let's say, cooperative and productive and functional relationship. I believe it's possible. And it's designed for, for all the reasons we have mentioned before. If you look at outside the world, those, for instance, those organi terrorist organizations that are looking at Europe, they don't make any distinction between <laughs> European Union or the UK, Norway or Switzerland. They don't know if Norway or Switzerland are members of the European Union. Yeah, it's Europe. It's Europe. And the UK is, I mean, quintessentially Europe. <laughs> Whether the UK wants it or not, that's the way the UK is seen. So we need to be together and leverage the influence, uh, the common values, of the same the, the way we are, uh, that basically we share the European Union and UK. And I think that's in our interest. And I believe the developments, the global developments that you mentioned, it, are going to drive us closer. And that I believe that's uh, the more likely evolution, and not only likely, but I think also desired from my point of view. So would you say, if you were advising the incoming Labour government, that they should go for a big bazooka with a big offer, uh, including something on security and defence, and something on mobility, and something on Erasmus, or... Steady she goes little by little. I, I, will, I, I think there should be a kind of a reset to the relationship. Uh, but now, how it's going to happen, I think I prefer not to go into detail. Because, in fact, I'm working a little bit on that. So, uh, and, and I think it's better from a political point of view to, to the... If the UK wants to take an initiative, it should be the UK. It should not be a European politician or former politician to tell what the UK should be doing. So it's for the... What I believe is that let me be a little brutal. The advantage of lobbying politics. Mm -hmm. In Europe, there was no respect for some prime ministers of the UK. And that's very harsh to say. Because the UK is a great democracy. It's the oldest, probably the oldest parliamentary democracy in Europe or in the world. I mean, my friends in Finland, they say they are the first because, in fact, the election of women was there possible, and the, the vote of women was before, as it happened in Finland before UK. So from that point of view, the truly democratic, uh, we have other parliaments before the, the, the British. Anyhow, it's one of the most oldest parliament, uh, parliaments in the world. But, and, but you know, these things count. And that's why I can give you my political testimony. When you are around the table, several, so like in the G8, G7, almost three days, and it's a personal interaction. Be frank, with all respect, Berlusconi did not have the same influence that other prime ministers. <laughs> and the country, wait, Italy is the mother of our civil, European civilization, or one of the most important sources of our civilization. Everything comes from Italy at the end of the day. Not everything, but most things come from Italy. Including, by the way, the Capitol. <laughs> but that's another point. So you see, the, the Prime Minister. Now, with um, a government that is respected, I think there is a very good basis for Europeans, European Union as such, to have a good, fruitful, uh, promising relationship in the UK, provided the UK also wants that, of course. And I'm sure, uh, I mean, big part of the UK wants that, and there, there are conditions for that. Now, how to do it? Uh, that's more delicate. And on that matter, I would want to go. I don't know, Joe, if you want to go more. Of course, he was the ambassador here, and so he knows much more about this than, than me. So, do you want to just comment? How, if you were, if you were now the ambassador to the UK, what would you be looking to do? I think I'll be looking to uh, encouraging the new government to work. Runs it. Oh, that's <laughs> difficult. <laughs> 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 uh, I would advise them to try to start. Try to start a new cycle, as, as uh, uh, Raymond Alcott said, a uh, reset. I think we, we need that for obvious reasons, and some of them were mentioned already here that today. And, and I think uh, it's very important that we re-establish full trust 
Uh, when I bought the Basta here for 1,020 days, uh, uh, we reached the lowest possible levels of trust across the chair. And that's certainly, I'm certainly to blame. Uh, maybe not, maybe not. Uh, I think things have improved, and I must pay tribute to the Sulak government. Uh, they've improved the relationship with Europe. I think Europe has made an effort. Uh, we, we did a lot of, we covered a lot of ground with the Windsor framework, uh, with the Horizon accession and all that. So there's progress that has been made. But I think we need, and my advice would be, be open, be uh, invest in this relationship for all the reasons that have been mentioned, but also because it's good for our people. It's good for the generation represented here it was maybe one of the biggest victims of Brexit in terms of, you know, mobility, Erasmus, exchanges, and all that. So I think we owe it to this generation to, to make it uh, uh, different. May, may I just raise one, another point before you open the discussion, which is another uh, uh, tremendously important exogenous factor that is going to uh, impact upon Europe and the UK and the US, and that is China. So uh, I would like to have Herman Alpabos' views on how should we deal with China? I see, I see the U.S. going in a, in a direction which, regardless of who wins the election, is going to continue one of, of uh, I wouldn't say confrontation, but a certain uh, degree of aggressivity. Uh, and sometimes for good reasons, sometimes not so good reasons. But anyway, the U.S. is in a different position than we are, We're much more dependent upon uh, upon trade and economic terms with, with China than the U.S. is. And, uh, and, and Europe is always faced with this situation, should we totally follow the U.S., our natural friends, should we uh, have an alternative positioning regarding China, uh, or should we rather, you know, share notes, compare notes, and, and, and have a common front with, with the U.S. Uh, situation in Europe is different if you take one country or the other. So this is a very complex, maybe the most complex after Russia, of course, uh, situation that we have to deal with. So your views on how to handle China uh, in the EU. That's not a friendly question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the chance to answer that, and then I'll turn to the floor to take some questions from the floor. Okay, thank you. But about China, I've been dealing with China for many years because I was very young, uh, foreign minister of Portugal. And in fact, it was during my time that we made the best steps for the handover of Macau to China. So Macau was handed back to China three years after Hong Kong in 99, but negotiations are critical were when I was foreign minister in 95, till 95. Since then, the Chinese call me a friend of China. Not because I am supporting, of course, the regime. I completely disagree with the regime, and I have very frank and robust discussions with them on some of these issues, uh, but because it was loyal, firm, but disagreements are disagreements. And I think this is a very important point. Because in relations between countries, it's not just what is how. To insult China, I don't think it's wise. I mean, to break all the protocols, Oh, I mean, it's better to be kind than, than to be rude. And Chinese, they don't like to be insulted. I don't think any country likes. And sometimes in some comments I hear coming from the United States, I don't see that intelligence in terms of dealing with China. China thinks, and they have some good reasons to think, that they have been humiliated by some Western powers, not only Western, including Japan, for many times. And now that's their time. See? They think they have the right to become one of the very important power, and that the United States, the United States, do not want them to be. They make some kind of separation with uh, Europe, and they try to divide Europe from the United States. I mentioned I was some time ago in Beijing, not only in Beijing, but I met the leadership there. I had no Xi Jinping, met him before and after uh, being in the commission. He was, in fact, the first president of the People's Republic of China to visit European institutions, to visit Brussels, the European Commission, and communal institutions. And in fact, they believe that there is an attempt not to let them assume their natural role. Now, of course, there is competition. And we have to be honest about it. There is competition and from the United States to China and also Europe. But I don't think it's good to have this kind of full decoupling. 
That's why I think the, it was a good idea. The Commission, European Commission, it was the European Commission that starts thinking about de risking. De risking is, is, I think, I mean, the Chinese also don't like that expression, but they should accept it because you, even from a management perspective, from a management risk perspective, it's obvious that one time we are one group of countries should not be too exposed to what happens in other parts of the world. And so when we have such a dominance of China in some areas, including trade and investment, it's rational and reasonable that, I mean, this is, uh, that there is some hedging and that management of risk. First, Brazil. Brazil is becoming, and Brazil's people don't think a lot about Brazil, but Brazil is a very important country. And Brazil, in terms of trade, is becoming too much dependent on China. So it's only natural that they try to, to diversify. The same with Europe. So I think Europe should have, first of all, I think it is desirable that the United States and Europe come to a common agreement on China. Because until now, there is not, not that, as well said. And I think it makes sense that we have a common strategy, sometimes even with different roles, but it's possible to have a common strategy with different roles. Secondly, as also was mentioned, in Europe, we will, the sentiment around European leaders is that we'd like to keep business open with China, for, also because Europe needs more foreign trade than the United States. We like to, like, like to. But of course, we should be found on issues where I disagree. Just to give an example that I know from my time at the Commission. In the 10 years I had summits every year with China, so called European Union summit with China, there was not a single one when they did not ask us to give them market economy status. And we never gave them market economy status, remember that. <laughs> and, but you're not insulting them. We're saying, with all respect, you do not fill the five criteria, technocratic criteria, that's the beauty of the European Commission, what I call the technical criteria of the European Commission. So these five criteria that define our market economy status. So you don't give, we don't give you. And, and uh, of course, there were the two issues that were difficult. Uh, one was arms embargo after Tiananmen, and this issue with arms embargo, they, they were not insisting, they understood that we could not. But the market economy status, they were putting pressure on the different countries. By the UK, at that time, was by far the biggest ally of China, putting us pressure on us. Of the golden age, remember, the UK and some northern countries were putting a lot of pressure on me and on the European Commission for us not to launch anti dumping uh, investigations on solar panels because at that time the UK was completely on the side of opening completely to China, <laughs> which for us, for us, the Commission was obviously a mistake because, in that case, our industry, industry will have been gone already. So, but the Commission tried to keep a, a balanced position, saying we can do that. Not do that. One thing I don't like in our attitude towards China, in Europe, and in the West in general, is sometimes putting the blame on others of what we cannot do, of what is our responsibility. I think the reason, the obstacle for our success in Europe, the only obstacle is between ourselves and our success is ourselves. We don't do our homework. And when we don't do our homework, of course we cannot be surprised that others do better. As simple as that. So we have to do better. In some areas, we have to do better. And in some matters, the Chinese are doing better than we are. Uh, for instance, in terms of investment in the green area, they are doing much better than we are doing. And of course, there is dumping. We are not naive. They are. There is dumping. There is, of course, strong state uh, support to the so-called state of enterprise and so on. There is a, more, a very protectionist attitude on China, from China. But we have put our, put our act together. In that case, then afterwards, you can have a frank conversation. So I would say competition without naivety, but not to be unnecessarily aggressive because that will put us in a difficult position also towards in the world. Thank you for that. I'm going to just take some questions. Could you just put your hand up if you'd like to ask any questions? <laughs> 